see if this managed to work. We'll see. Okay, so um, I haven't printed enough copies because I didn't know how, how, how many people will show up. So the idea is at least that uh, everything is online. And the idea is to, ideally you should, ha I will try to give you one, I'll try to make more copies in the break, uh, one paper to read. Uh, ideally, if you're nice, you read it for next lecture. So this will be a little bit background, so I don't have to, I mean, it gives you a bit of a, um, a bit of uh, overview. You don't need to get extremely into depth of the papers. There are some, some parts of them, are, I mean, there are review papers, they're quite advanced level on them. But they are, at least try to get the message they're saying. So for this lecture, there's a, there's a paper by Eugene Conin, but are the laws of genome evolution, discussing how, how gene, different genomes look like and how, what, what can you learn from the general view of genomes. So that's a bit what I'll talk about. There, there is, if you need more background, well, there is a book that you can buy. I don't, it's, it's old, it's not very good, but we ha I have taken quite a lot of things from it. So I've tried to follow the book, but you will manage without the book. This is the link to the, this paper. And then there are a number of Wikipedia and other pages I have here that are more background reading material. If you feel, I mean, particularly if you're maybe a physicist, you don't, you don't know what yeast is, you can go in here and you click there and you can read something. So these are things that, that basically are, for some of you, you will already know it. You know what an E. coli is if you're a biochemist. Probably more than Wikipedia does. But if you're not, it's good to read about it. And uh, this, this is kind of introduction things. So it's good to get an overview if you want to read something. So I would basically follow the outline of this book, but I will update with more modern things. And I try to, this, this is also on the Mondo page. So all material should be here. So if you have a Stock University account and you're registered for this course, you should be able to get it. I'm sure it won't work for everybody today, but hopefully it works sooner or later. So I try to put slides, all the links, all the material there. Um, and there's even a discussion forum thing like that it, 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 sure you can ask me questions directly or email me directly but if you put it there you're very nice to your colleagues because then you will actually they will see the answers also if you ask send me an email about that because so you might be someone else has the same qu problem and also the students and all the exams and everything will, all the assignments will be uploaded through the system so the, one of the goals of this afternoon is to get make sure that you can log in and see the course page and that's probably, if, if you are in this, on that list, it probably works. I think there are some people who don't have an S view account there, but most people should have it. And then there are some other people that might not have it, and then you have to be added to the system somehow. And I don't, I don't think I'm can do that. Okay, I'll try to give you one piece of material to read before each lecture, so with one short paper, a few pages. And um, I will try to put them, all the lectures on YouTube. There is a, something called the Introduction to Bioinformatics KB7004 2014 or something. I won't. I don't know what quality will be because I never really tried it before, but it should hopefully be work. Work. Uh, okay. So then, uh, otherwise, this is a course like everything else. So you have to do. You have to do something to pass, and uh, we will have. Uh, there actually. Quite a lot of things that you should do that are, uh, it has expanded through the years, but there's a normal exam, which is basic overview exam that, that tells you, do you know, can you describe this method? What is the difference between that? It's a little bit like kind of short writing questions. I mean, there are a couple of uh, test exams on the web, if you, so you can look at how it looks like. They're not kind of random, uh, kind of standard exams. There is an online exam that you basically should you show that you, the things you learned during the practicals that you can do that you can do it. So this will not be done at the same time. So there are two exams, and then there are basically the rest are assignments, and there are I said two types of assignments. There are programming and uh, um, practical more biophysics uh, assignments. They're all done in the computer room that I will show you in the break. Uh, and if you do this in time, we, we, we like people to do it in time, so then you, we basically give you some free credits so you can skip the first question, which is always the easiest question, so it's not such a game. But it's, uh, at least you get one full part. And uh, if you do the, 
Yeah, and you can do a, and there's also a part of this practical is actually to do a project which is very related to the lab. So you basically you're going to do something with your own project and you do a presentation of that. There are a couple of times when I put in discussion in the schedule. You can look at the schedule in a second. Um, and that is uh, you really just your chance to ask questions. I haven't prepared anything. I, I w try to get people to send me a e question before. But I've been to a number of discussions where nobody had a single question, and I've been here two minutes and we left. That's kind of unnecessary for everybody. So it's a good thing to have. If something is unclear, don't, don't be ashamed. It's like it's, that's, that's the best time to ask something. I mean, something that you're curious about. And it's just, if you ask difficult questions, it's better to ask me the night before, so I think I have some time to look up, looked up if I don't know it in my head. Okay, so this is, and all this should be on this Mondo. Second page here. Uh, I will ask the secretaries. Hey, sorry. There's a list here you're going to sign up somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I will ask you to, I mean, if you don't have a card to get into, you need a card to get into the computer room. So you should pass by the secretaries, maybe this afternoon, but otherwise tomorrow. I'm not sure where it is, but it, it's, they don't they don't want to have 20 people standing in line waiting for the um, for the course for, for making the cards. You better they get a list of cards and then you can pick it up tomorrow. The computer accounts hopefully works. They are not always um, well. It's always exciting to see if it works. But it's supposed to work at least most computers. And it's on the second floor. There's one floor down a bit on that direction. This house, this computer room. I go there in the break. Yes. Are we allowed to use our own computers? You can use your own computers, yes. And you don't really need after the programming. You need Python, that's, but uh, that you can get to any computer download it for free, so that's not a problem. So if you use your own computer, that's very that, that might be a good idea. Uh, I'm not sure if you're allowed to use it on the exam, but that's, I don't remember how we did that. Uh, that's. There might be some, th oh, well, there might be one, one other two programs you need, but it doesn't download them. That should not be a problem. Okay. So today, I will talk very, very basic things. I mean, really, what, what is, what is DNA? We have some physicists here. I guess they might know what DNA is anyhow because they want to take this course. But in a way, I'm sure that all the biochemists know it better than me. Protein, what is genome, what is bioinformatics, why it's important, and a, bit, and a little bit about programming. I will talk a bit more about programming tomorrow. Uh, I guess, actually, I put evolution here on top because it's kind of a often for comparison, it's an important concept, really, because that's somehow what shapes everything else. So it's a really back of the mind always when you do this. So, why do we need bioinformatics? That's why, why do we take this course? And it's a very, very simple reason is basically because suddenly, or suddenly, what? Well, suddenly, in a historical perspective, biology is becoming data rich. So, really, we have an explosion of the number of uh, data, particularly of course, sequences, DNA sequences, where a lot of nucleotides. So, this is old data. Well, oh, yeah, it's old, it's many years old. So, this is, this is a database of all genes and genome sequences, the gene bank, the size of it. So we, when I entered grad school, there was about one million nucleotides. And one million, okay, it was slow computers, but anyway, it was a, a reasonable number. Now we are up to 10 to uh, 12, or 10 to 15 probably today, which is getting actually hard even to handle with the best computer in the world. Because this is fa growing faster, frequency going up more and more. So the, the data is getting big. And this is, of course, due to Technological advances in uh, uh, in sequencing, so experimental methods, basically, the cost of uh, maybe that's not the cost of DNA sequencing has gone down extremely. Uh, here, use cost maybe hundreds of dollars, and when it applies now, it's one billion of dollars. So it's, it's really it's going down. So maybe we talk about the thousand dollar genomes. You should, you should talk. We're closer. So today it costs about one thousand dollars to sequence one human genome, which is six billion bases. So that's and that's it's going down, going getting down, down, down. And one thousand dollars is actually almost what you pay to go to see a doctor. I mean, it's cheaper to say one day in emergency care. That's much more expensive. 
So it's, 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 it's getting cheap. And uh, so we had the first Humagino, I'll come back to that in a second, the first Humagino was about here. Now in the UK they have the 100,000 genome project, you can see, sequence 100,000 British citizens. And in Sweden I think they're trying to get the 15,000 genome sequence. I don't really know why you need so many, because they don't think it's that informative. Right, you have to think what you do. But that's another story. Uh, so, and, and, and it's all not only uh, as a spin off to large thing that it is, you know, there are a lot of other techniques. So a lot, a lot, a lot of the data generated in in um, uh, in uh, biology is uh, I mean, is very rich in other types of data. You have imaging, you have large machines that make a lot of take a lot of photos. You have videos. You have uh, expression arrays. You have a lot of different types of data that are kind of complex and. Uh, so to, and to integrate this is, is, is getting more and more important and more and more difficult just because it's a pure amount of data. And you need to, well, no data is, is absolutely perfect, so you need to know what you do actually, to some extent, no, to, uh, to get out most out of it. We have evolution, so this is kind of the classic picture of evolution. We'll talk about more about it in some other le later, le le later lecture. So this is a tree. So basically this is a visual concept of something existed down here. So this is the last universal common answer. So something existed X number of billion, two or three billion years ago. And then it's very clear that we actually have three types of, three kingdoms of life in, 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 in on Earth. Well, you might have viruses also if you want to do, but they are kind of not alive. You have the bacteria. Different types. You have the eukaryotes, the ones that have the nucleus, so the us and uh, yeast and so on, and algae, plants, fungi. And, this here. and then you have the archaea, which is kind of a third group, which is uh, don't have a nucleus, but they have some some parts of them actually are more similar to eukaryotes, and some parts are more similar to bacteria. And these were discovered in the 70s by uh, both. And they, I mean, they were a bit, they were called IKEA because they, they live often in very extreme environments, so people have a tendency to believe that they are archaic, but they are most likely not. I mean, they are exactly how these things divide in the beginning, people discuss, and some people say that this should be look like this, but some people say that this actually should be more similar to that. But it's a bit of, a, it's probably a mix, because it was probably not one unique organism, it was a mix of different things. So you can't put such a long, strong statements on that. But it's clearly are three different, very, very separate kingdoms of life. And then you have the viruses out here which are not alive. So you can put it, I mean, you can do these trees and you can go into much more details of these type of trees. And you, and you have, well, the concept you have here which is important, this is basically from, uh, well, from Linnaeus or at least from Darwin, so you, have, you have species. You have really have, you can separate things into different species. I mean, you don't, you, well, a fish is not the same as a chicken, that's obvious. But also do you have a human, a chimpanzee, are not the same species. And of course, the definition of species is not always extremely strict. But I mean, the idea is that of course, there's something that... Hey, sorry. There is a list here. Sign it on your name or whatever it is. Uh, so there are... Uh, um, the idea is that you... There should be two species that do not reproduce, or produce vial offspring. It partly can be because they never meet, or I mean partly because they are, of course, you, you couldn't get a vial offspring between a dog and a human, but, but, but a um, donkey and a horse get a mule, which is not vial. But it's, 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 it's alive, but it can't get, most of them can at least not get any further offspring. But you have, for instance, if you take polar bears and uh, grizzly bears, and they probably, if they would meet and would uh, mate together, probably would wild offspring. But they don't live in such different places, so they never meet. So they, they, it's not always a very, very strict definition, but you have at least the idea. They are quite clear species. So something makes these species separate. So what's made a human, the humans jumped out, out of the trees and become humans and chimpanzees stayed in trees. Uh, but anyway, this is called, uh, you can actually just put here, I don't know what this means, this number section in this case. Okay, so this 
is what we see here. And of course, the basic of this is of course something that um, Watson and Crick discovered in the in the fifties. The DNA build well, they didn't discover the DNA, but they discovered the double helix. So and so, so for actually for quite a long time it was not absolutely clear what was the genetic material. Maybe had we started with Linnaeus in well, for one year, but Darwin about 150 years ago or something like that. And uh, while well, we had um, genetics before that, but so somewhere between Darwin and uh, Watson Creek, there was kind of debate what, what was the genetic, how, how did the, the information from one generation go on to the next generation? And I think there was, if you read, at least if you read uh, Watson's book, it was all the bright people re realized it was DNA, that was not uh, proteins. But there were some people that thought it was the proteins that actually was the genetic material. But it was not, uh, I mean, there was quite a lot of evidence that it should, that it should be DNA. So, of course, DNA has four bases, and RNA has also four, four bases. And these bases, we know we have a sugar, a phosphate group, and a base. And then they are linked in long, long chains. And uh, uh, RNA and DNA just differs on the sugar ring, ring here, which is different. It's different properties. And you have uh, four, four RNA or four um, DNA bases. You have uh, adenosine, guanine, uh, uh, tiamine, I guess it's called, uracil, and uh, cytosine. Tiamine, no, not tiamine, tiamine, cytosine, same. And uh, so C is in DNA and U is in RNA. And th what is important is so they can make up a long link here. This is, this is kind of known chemically. So you have your phosphodiester leakage here, so you can make a long chain. But of course, what is unique is that they can form this, this helices, double helices. So this is, uh, it's quite fascinating to read the, the Watson book, is that they were thinking there, they had these building blocks, they basically had models they made there, and they tried to put together, and once they, re and they knew it was a helix. They knew it was a helix, and knew roughly the dimension of the helix, and the, the things like that, and they had us from the X-ray data for that. But um, once they got together, they obviously saw that this came from hydrogen bonds, you have perfect hydrogen bonding patterns here. I mean, you know the chemistry here yeah, that you have a uh, uh, hydrogen between two nitrogens and uh, between the nitrogen oxygen and you have hydrogen bonds here. And obviously when you see this nice uh, helical signal, it's obvious how you can take one cell and duplicate it and keep the information. You just split in the middle, have some machinery that puts out another part, and you have two copies. Which is... Uh, of course, it's not a trivial process. I think how it works. I mean, I mean you're a biochemist. You know a lot of a lot of things that can go wrong, etc., etc. But uh, but uh, this is a, in theory at least, it's very 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 simple. And uh, but of course, we know that evolution acts on this. So there are sometimes it goes wrong, and you get a change with DNA, and that's. Most types, most cases, it's probably lethal, uh, and offspring dies. But some cases, it's <coughs> advantageous, and the offspring gets richer or stronger. And of course, it's it's more complicated when you have um, sexual reproduction because you have two copies of everything, etc., etc. So we know this is the replication. We know that it goes always the same direction. So here it has to jump sort in many places, but here it has to go backwards. Why well, no, uh, well, yeah. So th this is. And we also know that DNA information is transferred to an RNA. And we know that RNA is of course, it's based on the same type of base pair, but it's much more flexible. It's, it's kind of rare that you have these long helices. So the RNA structure can be very complex. So yeah, this is a tRNA, I guess. Looks like a tRNA to me. Mm. And so if you just try to paint whatever is in terms of what, or outline, it looks like that, but in the three dimensional structure, it looks like this. So you have like uh, parts that are helical, but then you have more complex structures here. And you have interactions not only between the base pairs that are base pairing, but also between the backbone and the other side and other types of interactions, etc. 
So this, so the, some of the most, uh, quite a lot of people at least, believe that this is actually the fundamental of life. So RNA is the is the first building stone of life because it somehow you, it could reproduce and duplicate. Because you have one copy, you can make another copy of it. At least in theory, it doesn't really happen. But there are RNA viruses that might do it, but in principle, you never do it. But uh, it also has much better chemical properties than DNA. It can be uh, have reactions. I mean, it can be an enzyme, which DNA really can't because you don't have any gr groups that can do it. And also because of the shape, it can form more complex shapes. It could maybe form more more enzymatic reactions. But it's, it's, so there is a quite strong belief that there was an RNA word before we had proteins and DNA. But that's, I mean, there are people that disagree also. So first, the central dogma of biochemistry, that I'm sure that at least most of you know. You have DNA, they can replicate, you can do copies of it. So this is the copy of one genetic information, next one. So this is what, what how evolution acts on changing this. And then, uh, when you make mistakes here, it's not only that you make change one base to the other one. You can be whole parts can be copied. You can make gaps in them. You can lose some parts. There can be rearrangements of the chromosomes. So there are, there are more complex changes also that can happen. But these are all called call mutations in some way. But then of course, in normal in a cell, the DNA is not replicated soon when you want to make two cells of it. Then you have it, RNA synthesis or transcription, which is the word for it. You just basically take the DNA information and makes an RNA molecule of it. And there are, in this case, what you call it is, is we could make a messenger RNA, so an mRNA, which is basically the, the part of this DNA that we want to make a protein from is transferred to this uh, mRNA piece and then. Uh, it's a translation, and then, then this, in the second sum, this is the ribosome that the protein synthesis to take this information from this mRNA. The ribosome is mainly RNA and builds a protein from it. So the protein has, I come back to the second, has 20 types of different amino acids in a long string. So it takes information from this, from three of these nucleotides, and decides which amino acid to build up. So that's one of the most amazing machineries in the cell is the ribosome. That really can, really can take this RNA information and make a protein of it. And it's, that's mainly an um, RNA molecule. It has a protein also. And this is also one of the, the ribosome is also one of the major reasons why you divide things into three different uh, kingdoms because they are quite different in the three kingdoms. So this is a bit more how it looks like from a molecular standpoint. We have, um, yeah, so this is the transcription, so the DNA here. To be able to, to duplicate it, you need to unrewind it. So you can think about it, you, you can't, you, you need to, um, you have to, to read it, you need to open it up. So you have to unwind it a bit, so you actually cut it and open it up. And here then you can copy it, and you have an RNA polymerase molecule, which is several molecules get put, put together. And that actually reads this and makes a new RNA transcript of it. As I said, the protein consists of 20 amino acids. So there are 20 different amino acid types. I'll come back to them in a second. But it uses three different nucleotides to read, to generate one. Uh, the one uh, amino acid. So we have two, 4 to the power of 3, which is 64, so 64 different triplets. But we only have 20 amino acid types. Well, actually, we have 21 because we have a stop codon also, which is here. Well, actually, we have three stop codons. But so we have 21 types. So that means that a number of these uh, Triplets code for the same amino acid. So, for instance, the proline here has four different amino acids. So, as soon as you start with CC, it doesn't matter what the third letter is. You can always make a proline. If you have 
on the other hand, if you have a tryptophan, it's there, you have UGG, you only have one single code for it. If you change it, the last one, something else will happen there. But in general, the last third codon is less informative than the other one. In most cases, you can change them often. And you can actually use this, for instance, for if you want to make study how much mutations you have. Because in, at least in most cases, if you change any of these to, between each other, the cell will not be affected. There are some effects on it, but in general, if you keep them in acid sequence, the protein will be the same and the expression will be the same. I mean, there's some st stability of mRNA and so on, but they are quite, in most cases, are quite marginal. So, the, so, they are, so this is like the, how the information from gen the genes go to make proteins. An important thing here is that actually, if you look at it, if you, that's, it makes things a bit complicated. If you think when we do sequencing, so we'll talk about sequencing later, but what we do then is what we get, we get the letters of the DNA. But we need to know where to start reading. Because if we shift one step, you get different, um, different proteins. Called, this is called a reading frame. And uh, because there are three stop codons, roughly every 20th, if you have a random sequence, roughly every 20th triplet will be a stop codon on average. So this is actually, if you want to find a gene, one of the best sets to do that, in particular in, in, in bacteria, in prokaryotes, is that to look for long regions in this um, DNA sequence you have without a stop codon. Because most proteins are more than 20 amino acids long. So that is, uh, but anyway, if, but if, if you get something wrong, and particularly, this also affects if you have a mutation that takes away one, one nucleotide from a gene, the rest of that gene will be completely wrong. Or one or two, or any number not dividable by three. So if you do that, so, so that's why they, these are more rare. Proteins. So proteins, as I said, are also long chains, so long polymers. They are uh, They have, a sh they have a, bit of a shorter backbone, I would say, than the, the, the ribosomes, and that's basically have only three residues, three atoms in the backbone, and the oxygen stick out. But then they have a side chain here. So they have a backbone here, which is because of three atoms, or four atoms, but with uh, one is not a part of the out. So nitrogen, carbon alpha, a carbon nil group with CO. And, and then the side chains have different properties. So there are 20 different side chains, and they, are all, they have different properties in the way that there are different sizes, there are different charges, they are hydrophobic, hydrophilic, etc. So, so they have different properties. They make up the, 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 the properties of that protein. Uh, but it's important, one important fundamental here is what we call secondary structure, is that you can form a hydrogen between this oxygen this nitrogen if you form regular structures of, of, of the proteins. So this is Linus Pauling in the 40s, 50s, I guess. Got Nobel Prize for this. And he found, I actually, at least there are, well, there are two types, and the one is can divide into two types, major high or secondary structures. So this is the alpha helix. So you can see here that you have one here, and then one, two, three turns later, you have another, you have hydrogen bonds. So it's actually has 3.6 turns, 3.6, I mean acids per turn. But it forms a regular helix like that. And then in the beta sheet, we have basically have uh, hydrogen bonds pointing across the sheet like this. And there are the strands going like that. And they can be parallel or antiparallel. Which one is which? I don't really know. But so it can be the parallel or antiparallel. So they can go like that or like that. And they form hydrogen bonds between each pair. So they're also quite stable. And then basically here, Every side chain in the strand here points one point inwards, one point outwards. So they point in different directions. So basically, you have two amino acids per turn. And these proteins, then, what is unique about them is actually forming a secondary structure is that they, that folds up to a th three dimensional structure. So most proteins, at least, 
have a unique folded three-dimensional structure. So, and that structure is what makes them be, to be functional. So, proteins makes most of the functions in a cell, and they don't make they're part of part of well, part of the ribosome most, but they don't, that's one of the few things they don't really dominate. But all the enzymes, all the structural parts of it, all the transport, all the input output, all the communication is made by proteins, and they all these proteins have different shapes. So basically, you make you have your se sequence here called primary sequence or primary structure sometimes it's even called, and then secondary structure, which then folds the th three-month structure. It's not really, if you look at really how it happens in, in reality, this is not that this one falls first and this one happens, this is a common process, but that's easy way to visualize it. And here you can think about, here something could bind, so you could have something binding here, or some parts could be uh, interacted with another protein here, so you have an interaction surface here. And then it can be regulated by maybe if it gets uh, uh, you get some uh, stimulus from outside, this binding breaks up and you get a signal to do something else. So you have, uh, it's a very intricate network of a lot of proteins that interact with each other. So you can classify proteins in different classes. You can classify them as alpha helical beta sheets, uh, alpha plus beta, etc. So you can do a second or second. There are groups of these together. And um, what you have learned is that uh, proteins that are evolutionary related, so proteins that, have, that are similar in the sequence, and then because remember, once upon a time uh, they were the same gene, which is one gene called one protein, once upon a time they were uh, the same gene, and then Maybe it was two species separated, or the gene was duplicated, or something like that. So now there are two different genes, two different proteins, but if they are still have a common ancestry, they are uh, uh, have most of the time the same structure also, or very similar structures. So the, this is to find this evolutionary relationship between genes is something that has been always a bit, one of the big part of bioinformatics, because that's how because uh, you also often believe that if they have the same structure, they have the same function. So if you had taken a new organism, you have find a gene, you know, and you don't know what it does, and then that's a common case today because we don't most cases most organisms have a like they have never ever studied. We don't know anything about them really because they are very hard to grow in the lab. We might know where we found it, or we might have some rough ideas about it, but we don't really know anything about it. So all the information we can get is by finding similarities between that gene and a uh, gene from. Uh, something else that we have started better. So we have E. coli, we have yeast, we have humans, the mouse, we have a number of organisms that we study quite well. And so we guess that, okay, if you now take another uh, bacteria, and if this gene in this bacteria looks like this gene in E. coli, they're most likely doing more or the same thing. But then of course, we want sometimes interesting in our differences, but sometimes it's not. So, so the development of algorithms to find Better classification of these similarities has been, for the last 20, 30 years, been an important part of bioinformatics. It's not the only part, but it's it's being it's important. And also, also actually defining what 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 does the differences make. I mean, they're not identical. So if you find if you make a mutation here, if this residue here is changed, certainly the binding properties will change with this protein. So maybe it won't bind this piece of DNA, but maybe it'll bind another piece of DNA. And can we figure? Can we predict? without doing experiments, what that is. Because nowadays, this sequence information is so much cheaper than doing an experiment. So anything you can do on a computer or by using this information will be very valuable. Okay, I will go on talking about genomes, but I think, I think we need a break. So we need a little bit of time to make sure that we look at the computer room and everything like that. Uh, so we might actually take, uh, let's take half an hour. For, you know, I'll show you the computer room and everything. Then I'll be back here a quarter past. Okay, so uh, let's continue. So um, tomorrow you get your cards, and so today you just knock on the door, and Marco Mirko will let you in. And some of you have cards. Uh, but um, uh, so let's talk about genomes. So, what is a genome? Uh, 
So th this is, uh, I guess, most people know how the word genome and uh, what is uh, why it's kind of important because it's basically that's what, that's what describes all of us. And it, it, it all started in the early 90s when um, Watson and some other people tried, but they wanted to become, make biology life science. They wanted to make to sequence a human genome, which was. People really believed that it was not possible then. But they really, really, really thought it was shit. Nah, this, it won't work. It won't work. It would really not work. But they had this very strategical, big industry skill. Of course, they got a lot of money when they got to the US and the UK mainly to do it, but also other countries shipped in. And a lot of phases in the beginning was technology development. So they had this centers competing with each other. How, who can do it faster? Who can do it cheapest? And some, someone had this bright idea to have a lot of students doing it. So they had a lot of lab, PhD students that were secret, that was not, they didn't win. The, ro the robots were more efficient. But there were huge technology advances. But, uh, so this started, what, the dates are there. So that, that started by basically, it actually finished before time, finished three years before, or finished to finish, but, but it started with the first bacteria. Uh, I don't know, here, and then you got to, you got to yeast, and then you got to the C. elegans, and then you got to human in basically five years. So this was like 95, something like that. I guess it's... No, 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 no. So, and of course, it, it kind of was um, Bill Clinton announcing the human, human genome in 2001, I guess it was, was the, the finishing out. So it was really, really it took about 10 years from the start of the project to finish it. And, uh, but I have a lot of things during time. This was actually, oh, I haven't updated this. Uh, so if you want, today the sequence in cost, or, uh, two years ago it's done, if you want to have 30x, so when you want to sequence your genome 30 times, which, which you want to do, because you want to, I mean, it's noise. So if you want to get rid of all the noise and you want to cover it in this random part of it, you need to have it about 30 times. It cost 100,000. It costed 100,000. I think it's down to one to 6,000 today, more or less. If you want to do the, all the exons, all the exon parts, all the parts that code for genes, it's one six, so that's probably another 1,000 kroner today. And if you want to look at the mRNA, so the only parts, it was 5,000 and over that, which is down to probably 500 or something. So that's, uh, it, that's, it's down to actually quite small numbers. And if you look at this, is some kind of chart that tells you how uh, also old. So this is like how fast you can sequence, it's basically going up like that. And the only thing that was decently fa equal fast was the number of websites that was developed for a while in the, up to 2000. That was very fast, but then also, but then also it, it kind of plateaued down everything. So this is based past by US dollars. This is, well, this is maybe that, the cost. This is the websites that went up in under 2000. And this is space for minutes, so you have fast kind of things. So, uh, but there are, uh, well, there's a few things you should think about when we sequence today is that we sequence actually often most of we sequence very short pieces. It's not that we take one genome, start here, and read the whole thing. What we do when we sequence is that we, what were the old, Project was to, was to divide your, pro, your genome into parts, you cloned it, you put it in the bacteria, so they were called BACs, so bacterial artificial chromosomes, and you then you take one piece at a time and then sequence together. So maybe you had a hundred thousand or a few hundred thousand base pairs, so you had many of these. Nowadays, what you do is basically you take your sequence, you, should, you blast it into pieces, or you sequence random pieces of it. That's why you need to do it 30 times, because if you just take random pieces, and the pieces are between 50, maybe and 200 nuclei long. So if you want, they, they, they want to put them together, which, which is, uh, that's why you need to have lots of coverage. But, but also there are, because you think of so short, so short parts, that piece, piece is missing. So things that are more larger arrangements, it's easier to miss. So what you do is you think of short pieces and you map it to a genome that you already have a good quality of. So you say, ah, oh, this part fits here, this part fits, fits here. There are some problems, there are parts that are, very similar and very repetitive, they look the same all over, therefore you don't know where it fits in that case. And then when there are computational problems, how do you do that fast also? That, that's another story. Uh, so there are, 
has been a number of uh, methods promised to British FSC as longer pieces, well, maybe a few thousand base pairs, or maybe up to five thousand. There are what maybe well, one that seems never to be able to produce anything that anybody can use, and one, but there's one system out there that you can do, but it's significantly more expensive to use per base pair. So today, I downloaded this yesterday, or actually yesterday, uh, this is the number of genome projects, 51,000. So all are main moon bacteria, but there are eight, almost 10,000 or 8,000 eukaryotes that are projects. And there are different status of finish and things like that, but it is like people are trying to sequence 50,000 different organisms. I mean, organisms already uh, exist in the world, I and mean, probably bacteria are a lot. Because bacteria is always very defined, defined species, because where, 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 where is one strain and one bacteria and one is another strain. But eukaryotes, I think there's, a, there's only about a million or something like that. We've got that huge number. Oh, yeah, no, probably more. Probably more. Probably, probably, by yeast as well, it's probably more than a million. But animals, they're probably a million or something. So they're not that many. They, they, we are getting there, so we sooner or later we have to sequence everything we have. And what can we do next then? That's the question. But, and in addition, there is a number of projects. So this is organic genetics. The number of projects are called metagenomic projects. So basically, you don't know what you do. You go out and piece, take a piece of soil and you sequence whatever is there. And this is so you actually and or a piece of water or a piece of uh, some other environment or a piece of, of um, your stomach fluids. Not bacteria. I mean, it's not like one bacteria you try to grow it and sequence it. It's a mix of different things. And this is actually, I mean, particularly stomachs has been very important during the last few years because there's been quite good evidence that you're, you actually have more genetic material in the bacteria than you have in your cells. And it's quite a large variation between humans and it's, and it's also quite stable. So it's actually what, what you have, you probably have a long time in your life. So all these ideas of having eating some yogurt with some live bacteria doesn't really have to because it doesn't affect your certainly your diet affects a little bit some bacteria go up and some go down but they are they certainly they are they are quite stable. And there was something I read was last week was that they actually sequenced houses. So you go down to, you go down to a house or an apartment and you take some swabs from the doorknobs from the kitchen and things like that. And it's every house has a very individual signature. So you can read this. And, and, it, and the interesting thing was that if you move, so this is so false. This is all, I mean, you exhale, you touch things. So this, it's a mix of the people living there and the house, and they, they kind of, of course, get, get balanced. But you bring it with you. So after well, someone, a couple living in a hotel room or a family, and then moved into a house, an apartment. And two weeks later, the same, you can find the same bacteria the doorknobs that they had had in the hotel room that they brought with them to the new house. So really, you, you, are, you are the main source of uh, the bacteria. So it's like you, you bring not only your physical body, but also your bacteria when you move to a new house. Uh, so that is so-called metagenomics. So you have to go out, swab, swab something, see, see, see what is there. And in these cases, you get, if you're really lucky, if you're only one, if it's a very narrow f set of species, you can get whole genomes. But in most cases, you have just part of genomes, where you have to guess what, what, what are the organisms there, what type of bacteria is it, etc. And, so and there's a lot of biomedical challenges there. Genome sizes. So this is basically what this lecture, what this one talks about, uh, part of this. It's about genome sizes. So what, what can we say about size of genomes? So, there was one, uh, so this is an overview. So we thought, of course, we are humans, we thought we were most complex, we had the biggest, most complex genomes. Well, the size of the genome people can actually figure out way before you put a genome sequencing, it's just to take the chromosomes and measure the size of them more or less. Uh, but uh, the number of genes is a different story later. But here, you, here, this is basically some rough ideas of sizes. Viruses are mostly small. There are viruses that are seven million base pairs, so this is a bit underestimated. But there are big base pairs. So basically, they are order of less than a million base pairs, 100,000, 10,000, so there are even small ones. 
so then uh, for example live and then bacteria is between one and well, half and ten million base pairs so they are smaller uh, they, there is some overlap there on the lower side and then you have basically the single cell eukaryotes and in particular archaea are often quite small you know but they are so some of the first bacteria sequence ones were, were uh, the ones were smallest because you could complete was easiest to do but the bacteria genome you know, is, is 10 million base pair so say we say it costs 1000 kroner to sequence or, or, or I think it was 10,000 kroner to sequence 36 billion base pair so this is the cost of yeah, well, one dollar if you can do it in combination with other things maybe it costs nothing to sequence the bacteria if you find someone else to run the rest of the machine for you and so then the yeast and some other small Animal, uh, small multicellular organisms are in the small. So they are maybe from 10 million base pairs up to a billion base pairs. And then it's kind of a huge variation. Pl some plants are gigantic. Mammals are in the order of a few billion base pairs, between two maybe and eight. Birds are a bit smaller for some reason. Fishes are maybe a bit smaller. Amphibians are also huge variation. Particularly plants are huge variation. Protists also use variations. So some of them have large duplications. They're basically duplication, duplication, duplication. They have lots of cops or the same thing. So, it's not that, so this, doesn't, this group here doesn't really correspond to the number of genes, always. It's just genomes get very big. So, this, this is about why people talk about junk DNA. So, people, parts of the DNA that is, seems to be not important for the survival of the organism. Well, you can define it's not on a selective pressure. Uh, yeah, so this is another slide of the same thing. It's viruses, prokaryotes, eukaryotes. So you see there's some overlap. And this is genome size. And, uh, so. and this is number of genes. And it's kind of a linear thing, but it's, this is a large spread there. So there are, particular here, there's a lot of overlap. So there are a lot of uh, prokaryotes that have maybe more genes, but have than the eukaryotes. It seems to be a slight, you can see that a slightly more diverse, uh, uh, le less um, strength here because there are, some of these are, um, uh, it seems to be more, more genomes, genomes seem, genomes seem to be bigger but for the same number of genes in the eukaryotes because there are more junk DNA, so more parts are non-coding or the genes are longer but then that's, that, that's as well known. So we have this so-called uh, transposons and other elements that have been duplicated you know, many times. But otherwise it is a relationship here, yeah. but there's a particularly among the eukaryotes a large variation. And these I guess are something wrong with just down to ten genes that cannot just exist. Uh, Okay, uh, well, so this is the genome sizes. So this is actually the first organism ever sequenced. It was the Epstein Barr virus, I think, or at least one of the viruses. But it's only 10,000 base pairs. And then, but, but it's still it's almost the same size as. Well, there was another virus before that, but uh, bacteria then E. coli is 5 million, yeast is 12 million. The small animals, the C. elegans and the fruit fly, are 100 million. And they actually one plant, so the Arabidopsis, is also very small. Mo many plants are gigantic, but this is a small genome plant. A human is 3 billion. Yes, I should have a slide. So it should be something with date cells, but it was not there. Uh, and here's another system. So you see a number of, there's a long list of things. So th this is from, from the paper that I gave you. So are there some um, laws you can learn from this? Can you, can you, give, can you tell you something? Right, well, this, this is what you can read for tomorrow. And um, uh, you can, as I said, there is uh, a number of laws. So you can say, for instance, you look at the, if you look at if you group genes into families. So, so how does a gene duplicate? How do you have two copies of genes? No, it's very common that you have duplications. I said the, the mutation can act on duplicated parts of the, of the genomes. You can have, get one copy to be two copies. And then, of course, 
if that one survives in evolution, you can have two copies of that gene, and then they, they often times they will diverge and be those slightly different things because the mutations will happen. So you, you can group genes in families. So how many families? Uh, how big is uh, uh, how many members do you have of a sort of family? And that's one of the reasons why we have more genes than uh, yeast or you, you bacteria. It's because we have some families that have expanded a lot. So if you plot the size of the family uh, versus uh, uh, the number of uh, so how many families do you have of size 1, 2, 3, etc.? So a number of gene families. So you see that most families you only have are only one copy of the members. You only have one member of the family. There's a few, two, three. And this follows uh, what's called a power law distribution. So basically, if you take a log log of these two plots, you get a straight line. And many phenomena in, in uh, if you look at this gender phenomena, look like that. So you have, you can do the same thing looking at the interactions or things like that. So you can look at this. So and most, so most things are kind of rare, but there are a few th families that are extremely common. So it's not like a normal distribution, it's not like you would have that an average you have three, 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 comp three families of this size and you have a distribution. It's really, some are extremely common, so you have immunoglobulins, for instance, and many, many humans, or GPCRs, so the receptors for uh, smell and everything else, or a lot, lot of other receptors, they, are, they have hundreds of these. But most genes exist only one copy. And uh, mm, you can do the same thing in different categories here. You can this is, uh, some genes in some categories are, if you look at how many genes you have in the genome or a certain category, and there are some, you can, they, they can be divided into three different classes. So there are some, basically, particular genes that are basic metabolics so you have only one copy of or a few copies same number of copies of in every organism basically so this is the size this is the size of the genome number of genomes in the genome and this is the number of copies of these families basically but you have uh, others that really increase by size particularly the more complex organisms so anything that's involved in regulation and so on if you have a more complex cell many cells you need to interact with you need to have more things to interact with you have more things that, that, that they really increase by size and then there's something that are in between. So really there is a different genes, families of genes behave differently for different, uh, depending on the size of the genome. And then there are things when you really look at the evolutionary rate, so how many mutation fast has evolved, the things that evolve fast have a lower abundance, I guess. That. Yeah. I started talking about this, but uh, this is, uh, I should maybe. Uh, so now I'm talking a bit about sequencing. So this is what was one of the reasons why we are here. So this is a traditional way to do sequencing. It's good, it's good to have in the back of your mind that these sequencing methods work and how things actually become arrows and so on. So you have your uh, uh, piece of DNA. Uh, template, and then you have a primer, so you have something to start sequencing, and then you, you put in some labeled uh, nucleotides and you have that are la that, that stops this uh, uh, primer to go on, so, and, and, and then there are also some marks you can detect them. And of course, they never stop at different size, and uh, so this one, this, but this will only s stop at the uh, one of the nu nucleotides, so the ACDT. So you will generate a lot of different primers of different lengths. And then you just do a normal gel, so you separate them by size, and then you can just start reading the G, T, T, A, so you have your T, A, C, G, T, A, T. But you see, after a while, it's, the longer, longer you get, well, it's still quite nice, but, it's, but, but you then start, the difference in size becomes relatively small, it's a bit smaller, 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 it's difficult to read it. Particularly, maybe if it's this two or three here, so there's, there's, there, are, there are some problems interpreting it. But this is how they started doing it in the 90s. But then they. Uh, switched to fluorescent nucleotides that you can do with much more efficient than the, the radiative label one. And. Uh, 
så det är ju flera som är skulle läsa. Jag har ju väldigt aldrig mätt Jag har så här lite om all teknik, like power sequencing och så vidare. Jag tänkte så här. Så, um, jag har så här. Um, jag har en sekret till your sequence. Jag har ju tänkt på det du gör där. Next step is often to do this gene prediction. So, as I said, I talked about before here, someone asked me in the break that you try to take, you have your nucleotide sequence and you want to identify genes. And this is in the prokaryotes, it's not that hard. Uh, you use some computer sequence based genome prediction, which basically goes like this. You read the complete genome sequence in some format. You search for all open reading frames. So basically you have six different directions, you have six different starting points. You can start in position one, two, three, but you can read in that direction or that direction. Because genes can, exi- gene can exist on both sides of the DNA. And they do exist on both sides of the DNA. So you have six times the length of the genome possibilities to search for. Uh, uh, well, then you, uh, Uh, so basically, then you basically, uh, well, this open reading frame is basically that anything that is between a start codon, which is an AUG normally, and a stop codon. That's, that's an open reading frame. So, you, so and uh, you have often a minimum length of after you have 50 res- nucleotide, 50 residues or something like that. Because of course you don't take anything one or two, because that would be. And then you can calculate them at. Uh, uh, Depending on so how you have some orientation, or you, you can do, uh, you can compare them to other proteins and the amino acid frequencies. Does the amino acid frequencies really relate to this? Uh, is it a very random amino acid sequence, or is it something you would expect? You can look for this for um, uh, in other databases uh, Where you, where you have, uh, is it similar to something I've seen before? Can I annotate it, etc. And that's the end, at the end you come out with some protein, potential protein coding genes. So this is kind of a very logical thing. N- nowadays what people do is, when they, of course, we do computer programs that try to do all of this and try to put all together in a good statistical way. But, uh, but in the prokaryotes it works quite well, but if you look at the eukaryotes, which has much more complicated genomes, it's much harder, because a eukaryotic gene can look like this. It has some. It still has start codon. One difference is that the initiation site is much more com- less conserved. There's more variation there, and it's bigger. So there's a lot of things that are a part of the gene, but that is um, not protein coding. There are re- the regulatory elements. So when should this gene be turned on? When should it be turned off? Etc. That are part of the gene. And then you have. The other big difference is that you have introns and exons. So basically you have exons are the part of the protein and introns are things that are cut out of the mRNA level. And uh, so you have some signals here at the 5 and 3 prime ends of the exons that tells you to be cut off. But they're not extremely conserved, so they're a bit hard to identify. And the main, but the main problem is that these are, can be quite short. So if you know that you have uh, Uh, a random stop could not every 20 amino acids. So if this is not much more than 20 amino acids, then it's hard. Then, then it's hard to know if this is a random piece of DNA or if it's actually really an exon. So uh, what you do in many cases, that is that you nowadays is that you compare to other genomes because you know if this is because this is selective pressure. If these parts are conserved m- much more than these are, so you compare in mouse to human. So if the exons look the same. Uh, etc. They are maybe more likely that it's exon exon than intron. Uh, and of also if there are other evidence you found in some other experiments, etc. So a lot, lot of data they put together to, to get it right. Uh, but it is still, if you go to a database today, there's a lot of noise. There are lots of cases where you have, if you really look at it carefully, you realize that some exons are missed or some exons are probably not there. There's also one thing that complicates in higher eukaryotes, particularly that you have alternative splices. In some cases, some exons are skipped in some genes. Or there's a variation. Sometimes there are either that or that exon included. So 
there's nothing that's that are difficult. And in that case, maybe it's so very similar. So if you do sequencing, it might be hard to find the sequence um, difference between these two places. Because they are really, if you take a really piece of sequence, you don't know if these are basically identical, you don't know if it belongs here or it belongs here. So there's still a lot of work if you want to, want to get uh, uh, things uh, perfect. Oh, so this was just the prokaryotes, as I said before. So this is basically, as I said, what happens in, in eukaryotes is that you start codon, stop codon, you cut out the introns, and you get the final uh, uh, translation to the protein. Just a little bit of numbers again. Uh, on this general overview. So look at the typical prokaryotic genome. You know, I guess it's E. coli, but I don't remember. Yes, E. coli. So one thing is you have um, sometimes the genes are organized in cl clusters. Uh, so they're controlled by single control regions. So in this case, it's something done with tryptophan synthetase. So it's tryptophan synthesis. So it's Protein A, D, C, B, A, B, they're all regulated. They're all, so if you need to make tryptophan, you need all these genes. So that it's convenient to have one code in there. So you can find things next to each other. And you can see that you, if you look at the number of sequences that are in different categories here, you have most, uh, so this is functional classes here. So there are a lot of proteins that are used in translation, cell process, biosynthesis. A lot, lot most of the genes are in kind of basic. Uh, metabolic and uh, functional things, like metabolism here. Uh, so there are, well, in this case, I'm still called an unclassified one, but there, there are a lot of genes that are made in metabolism, in catabolism, some enzymes, and so then the basic mechanism of, of transcription and translation. If you say go to yeast, uh, of course, it's a genus with about twice as big, and it's not as many. Well, not so many, not twice as many genes. It's probably just 25 percent more genes. But you have um, quite a lot of genes that are. Uh, once, for instance, you have one thing that actually the protein genes that are involved in protein fate, so in protein folding, so they make sure that other proteins don't fold incorrectly. Uh, and the other thing is the binding. Co-factor requirements. So there are a lot of things that bind other. There's a lot of interaction with other proteins and transport that you don't have in yeast as much. You have much more. You need to because it has different compartments. You need to transport things. You need to regulate things. Like a lot of these things are are much more. You still of course have the metabolic genes and other things, but there are not so many more than you have in E. coli. Right? Go, go, then go on to the human genome. Uh, you have a lot of genes that are involved in DNA binding, for instance. The most common one. And that's of course because what you need to do that is to regulate what other genes are expressed. So you need a lot of genes that are you have a hormonal uh, response somewhere that's going to tell that these genes need to be expressed so that this cell can start doing that because all the different cells are different. You have RNA binding, transcription factor. So as in, yes, and then you have also quite a lot of genes that are enzymes. A lot of protein kinases, but that's part of the signals. So that's one of the signal pathways. Is is a GPSR that is? Oh well, no, it's protein kinase. It's not GPSR, but they have mm, kinase pathway that is also that are uh, signals in the cell. You have quite a lot of receptors, transmembrane signal, a lot of receptors also communicating with, with between cells, etc. And of course, the genome is much bigger, it's about fifteen. Well, in this case, about fifteen thousand, about twenty thousand genes. A lot of repeats in the human genome also, and you can divide them maybe into uh, at least four groups, the short and long ones. So these are basically the size, the size of it, and there are see there are millions of these. They're, they're copied and repeated. Hundred base pairs are copied a million times over the human genome. So it's hundred millions or a few hundred millions of. Uh, so 10% of the, or 30 percent of the genome, genome is made of that, that. Long ones even more, it's 20 percent that are repeat, repeated. So there's more in the termini, and also the transposon, 
which is a part of which is very, very hard to sequence. There are some indications that this is a very important region for some particularly mental diseases, and also maybe for evolution or, or, or from, from being compared to chimpanzees, but it's a very hard part to sequence because it's very repetitive. Uh, yeah, so this is what this is the overview of this. So, as I said, sequencing is not just to get, uh, it's not just that we manage to get many more sequences in the genome today, we have also use these techniques for other things. So, so one of the powerful things today is actually to ex the expression analysis. So expression analysis is like how much of each gene do we have in each cell. So you often you want to say, well, of, of this that you have a cancer cell, and you want like, what is the mutation that happens? It's like actually what you say, what, 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 what genes, what proteins, what functions of this cancer cell are changed? Because that's a good, could be used for, for understanding developing drugs or potential drugs for it. Uh, and uh, uh, what you can do then is, I mean, the first technique that was developed there was what's called microarrays. Basically, you made put small, small, small glass plates. You put small pieces of the of the DNA there or RNA, and then you ha you put your cell on top or the RNA from the cell on top of it. And so if there was binding, you got the color. So it has a fluorescent part. So you get and you compare this with some background. Nowadays. So this was a big technique, and it was quite efficient. But nowadays what you do is that you, it's because sequencing is so cheap, it's actually just take all the RNA, all the mRNA, and you sequence it. So then you measure how much RNA you have in different cell types. Uh, so that's the RNA sec. After you do, as I said, I also do metagenomics, you can go Swap the do door knobs and see what, what is happening in the environment. You can look for just mutations. You can just take the exons. You can see because the exon part of it. That there are techniques to do that also. So that is, but that's mainly just to save money basically. Okay, so that's basically what I was going to tell you about it today. Tomorrow. I'll uh, try to do some very rough introductions to some programming. I will see if I remember some Python. And I, there are two papers here that are not extremely, I mean, they're not hard to read. I mean, one is, the, this is probably one that is best to read. It's called a primer for, I think, I don't know which one it is. Um, Network. So th this is just a very, very short introduction to Python, which is a programming language that you will use. And there's another one which is more, uh, it's more advanced, right? it's more advanced, it's actually uh, more of a, of a philosophical thing is actually that you should think about, not now during this course, but if you become a mathematician, and well, any programming job is like, how do you maintain your code? How do you think about doing things for the future? How do you make things uh, using, learning the right tools, etc. So that is, I mean, what standards you use. You use. But that, so that is not really for this course, it's more fun to have this background. But it's, uh, this, one can, this one can be good to read for tomorrow. And then if you have time to read this uh, uh, Kuhnian article about the laws of genomes, we can see if you have some questions about it tomorrow. I might be able to answer it. This one doesn't work. Okay. I think that's... We upload the PowerPoint.